Thank you very much for coming. It's a pleasure to see all those new and familiar faces here in this room. Have you enjoyed the conference so far? Yeah, I did too. Good. All right, I have a first question to you. You've probably heard of a saying like, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You certainly did. Well, it's not just a saying, it's actually something formulated as a law of the instrument by the American philosopher Abraham Kaplan. But not the Kaplan Moss, the Django author. It has nothing to do now, different thing. Yeah. Well, anyway, what does it have to do with today's talk? The thing is that uh, I believe that this saying, it perfectly illustrates the way we work with the web today and the way we are using HTTP. We're a bit childish by using HTTP because it's our hammer. Whatever task we have, HTTP, do it, do it, please. But there is more than HTTP on the web. So HTTP was not designed to do the tasks that we often force it to do. The protocol itself, the HTTP, is just centered around the request and response, that's it. There is no progress reporting, there is no multiple re um, re requests or responses per request, anything like that. If you need something, you can build an abstraction up top, of course, but at the end, even if you build like the pseudo async communication with HTTP, it still does not change the way the underlying HTTP protocol works. It's still synchronous and it's still centered around the request and response cycle. So again, the idea is that simple. In the good old times, there was just a request to the backend, we fetched the page, we displayed it, that's it, easy. Well, then the web evolved, of course. It became smarter so that we needed the application server. It also became more beautiful, so we needed the CSS, images, fonts, files. And then it's, the picture changed more or less like this. So we still have our browser, the client. It makes requests to the web server to get stuff, more stuff now, and even more stuff, but it still fits in the paradigm still fits into the way the HTTP is supposed to work. Just more requests, but that's okay. The first time I noticed, I remember, that something goes wrong here is when I had to deal with uh, icons. Do you remember a good old times of the icon sprites? Like this? It was an obvious problem, like, hmm, we have too many icons. That means too many requests. HTTP is not handling that well. What can we do? Oh, let's pack all of the icons into one image and just offset it. Uh, to the left and to the right. Genius. Well, this is something that I mean by the web abuse and using the HTTP not in the way it is designed to be used. It has nothing to do with web sockets, but the story is going. Then, async requests. So the, the problem was fixed by introducing Ajax when we thought like, okay, we need some periodical updates of our content without reloading the whole page. And then uh, we got Ajax, but at the end it's good However, Ajax does not change anything for the backend. Ajax is a pure client-side technology. For the backend, it looks totally the same way, and it's again the very same HTTP. Moreover, if you take a look on how exactly the paradigm, how exactly Ajax update works, like we wanted to get something like a dialogue between the client and the server. What's a dialogue? Well, dialogue is like when two parties exchange their opinions, they're equally involved, they are respecting each other. This is a dialogue. But how our dialogue between the browser and the backend look? It's more like this. Because at the end we are dictators. The client is a dictator. The servers are not allowed to speak, only when we ask. So it is kind of a funny way of doing dialogue in my opinion. And so although Ajax solves this problem partially, meaning that we can just periodically ask the backend about the updates, and it's a pseudo dialogue, it's still ugly. So, yeah, as I already explained, we have a couple of problems. We have, um, first problem is that the dialogue is not really a dialogue, it's a pseudo dialogue. And the second is that you still need a lot of requests and the more frequent updates you want, the more requests you do. And this obviously does not scale well. Moreover, uh, you are still using HTTP on the, uh, uh, on the background. HTTP has quite a high uh, noise to the signal ratio, meaning that you send all of the headers, all of the cookies, everything, just to get a response from the backend, nothing new happened. That's not cool. And then we come to the long polling. Well, <laughs> this is already something. This is already some progress, let's say. We open a connection, we keep the connection alive, connection is just idling, 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 and whenever something new happens on the backend, we push it through. Well, that's great. HTTP overhead is still in place, but at least it's not periodical as Ajax. It's waiting for stuff, idling. And in my opinion, well, 
it's of course good because mm, you get things asynchronously and it's even better because long pollen is kind of romantic because if you think of it it's like looking in someone's eyes when no words are needed you just wait and wait and wait and then and then he or she replies something to you the problem is i don't think that my level of relationship is already there on the web i don't want it enough please every time you use long polling a guy from boston dynamics kicks a robot <laughs> now finally Enough of this nonsense. There is just one way to do the real-time bidirectional communication between the client and the server, and that is WebSockets. Nothing else. Forget socket IO. Forget these libraries that are built on top of usually long polling and in the worst case, Ajax. They are outdated. There is totally no reason not to use WebSockets these days. As the developers, we can finally benefit from, from uh, WebSockets because we have no longer a problem of the HTTP overhead. We have no longer a problem of the real full duplex connections, meaning both parties can start talking to each other as a normal dialogue. And finally, the interface is really easy from the client as well as from the server. I'll show you in a moment a couple of code pieces and as well as a demo. Uh, but first, just WebSockets in a glance. So another cool advantage is that the WebSockets, they are not HTTP, but they are compatible with HTTP, meaning that they run on ports uh, used by HTTP 80 and 443. So uh, all of the firewalls will work. All of the proxies will probably just let it through. So basically, you do not need any new setup in your infrastructure. You can just use Nginx or whatever reverse proxy you use. It should just work. Then um, how exactly we, we, we jump from the HTTP to WebSockets protocol? We start normally, as we always did with HTTP. We do the, uh, the handshake, we establish a connection, and then our client says to the server that, hey, I want to upgrade to the WebSockets protocol. And if the server supports it, it says, yeah, do it. Then they establish this connection, the full duplex TCP connection. They do not communicate over that connection with HTTP. Now it's pure WebSocket connection, meaning that HTTP headers do not go through it. And this is cool because we're not sending HTTP overhead anymore to the client every time. All right, uh, let's go for the use cases. So obviously, it's stupid to say just use WebSockets for everything because there are good sites and bad sites. So the good cases for WebSockets are uh, any cases when you need to uh, implement kind of a multiplayer behavior. It's obviously games. It's also tracking system when you have multiple objects, let's say, moving on the map and you need to update their locations in the real time. This is uh, like a typical scenario for WebSockets. Also the collaborative editing, Google Docs. When you have, again, multiple cursors writing text at the same time, that's exactly the case. However, uh, as I said, there are also bad cases to implement WebSockets. First of all, because you are, with losing, HTTP, uh, with, uh, losing the HTTP overhead, you're also losing the benefits of HTTP, and that is caching. That are the standard HTTP responses like 404, 400, 500, and so on. Uh, most of our JavaScript uh, clients these days, they automatically react to the problems, uh, to the error codes of HTTP. Like if you return 500, so the, your uh, web framework will know that it's a server problem, 400 is a client problem. Well, on WebSockets, we don't have an overhead, meaning we don't have status codes. Well, all that you get is just a message, a pure message. And then it's up to you to handle it. So if you want to say there was an error, you cannot send the status code because there are no status codes. You have to somehow encode it yourself and then on the client, parse it yourself and see, oh, this was an error. So remember this. Then uh, in HTTP, we know that GET requests are idempotent, meaning that you can repeat it as much as you want. In WebSockets, you cannot say it. Again, it's just sending a message. There are no GET and POST in WebSockets. It's just sending a message. So it's up to you to decide if you want to build it in idempotent fashion on the backend or not, and the client also has nothing to do with it. Now, uh, let's see a little example. As I mentioned already, WebSockets are really, really easy. So to prove it, here is the vanilla JS example of uh, what do you need to do to establish the connection with the backend. Can you see it? I can. <laughs> you can? Oh, that's, that's great. That's already something. I don't have the mouse here, but all right. Uh, I'll just comment it like this. So as you see, we're just uh, not using any sort of libraries. It's a pure JavaScript. You open the debugger in Chrome, and that's what you need to type. 
So you are creating first the WebSocket connection to that host, in this case, local host, and then you define three callbacks. What to do on open when the connection is established, what to do when you get the message. In this case, I'm just appending it to the document body and what to do on error. Obviously nothing, like who cares about that. These are 10 lines that you need to write to use WebSockets. So it's really, really easy. Now it would be, of course, boring if I wouldn't come up with a demo. I thought like, I want to get some feedback about this talk. And the best feedback for a speaker is obviously throwing tomatoes at him. <laughs> so I really like this shirt, so please don't do it right now. But uh, you can do it on the web. So if you just go to, oh, this is the wrong URL. You go to, I'll just do it with you. Go to demo.caseres.me. Um, slash Europython. You don't have to do it, but if you have a laptop anyway, you can just do it. Then you learn how to uh, how to use WebSockets. I here I have a little code snippet. I'll just zoom zoom in for you. I didn't make it much better, but anyway, you'll get the idea. So what, if you copy this into the debugger. Yeah, I saw that someone already did it. You are throwing tomatoes on the speaker. Well, you might think that this guy is actually not so bad. Like, I do not want to throw tomato on him. I better throw a candy. You can do that too. Then instead of tomato over there, you write candy. Oh, somebody throw an egg on me. Oh, that's bad. <laughs> All right, well, anyway, have fun. <laughs> have fun with it. Uh, what this demo shows is that when all of you are throwing tomatoes on me, I like tomatoes, that's fine. When, when you're doing it, um, uh, one person throws it and everyone sees it everywhere. Because uh, on the background, what you do is you send, oh my god. <laughs> Could you please send some candies too? Or cats, you can send cats, by the way. Oh my god. Yeah, so you see it's updated in the real time. One person sends, everyone receives it. And if you like reload, oh, this is sweet. If you reload the page, then you get it all at once. It's just uh, the WebSocket is pushing through everything that it received by now. And this is just that three lines, uh, four lines over there. And you can, watch, uh, you can see the source code. There are no libraries involved at all. It's just one HTML page with JavaScript inlined. Super easy, super cool. I want to say to you that there is no barrier in not using WebSockets these days. Now back to the presentation. Yeah, you can have fun meanwhile. <laughs> let's, let, let's see at the end. Uh, let, let's see at the end what's there. I'm really <laughs> interested now. OK. Now we still have time to see uh, how much time do we have? 15, great. So uh, now we obviously want to see, it's a Python conference, how can we use it from the backend side? So we have uh, several frameworks that can do it, and the easiest one is Tornado. Well, in my opinion. Tornado is kind of a Flask, but the async way. You all know that Flask is super minimalistic, but Tornado is also minimalistic. You can have just one Py file, and this is actually all that you need, this 26 line. 26 lines to run the web server with web sockets. And you have here already the handler implemented. This is literally all you need to do. Pip install tornado, that you have it running. Now let's just have a few, uh, a few comments on what exactly does it do. It's very, very much similar to what we do on the client side. We define three callbacks on open, on message, and on close. Uh, what, what should we do? And when you receive a message, obviously the on message callback is triggered. And in this example, I'm just sending it back. I do self.write message hello. And this just sends back hello and whatever you received at the beginning. That easy. Of course, it's not so easy if we want to throw tomatoes on the speaker. It gets a bit more difficult because you want some place to store all of the thrown objects. And then you want to send it not just to one client, you want to send it to all clients, meaning the broadcasting. But for this, you can just use plain Python tools. Just append everything to the list, 
and then when the new client connects, iterate on that list and send it back. So there is no magic. It's just normal Python data structures in this case. I implemented it super simple on purpose. Like you do not need any kind of readme file for this. Super easy. But if you want more complex setup because it's still minimalistic, now you can take a look on Django. Django channels is very different because Django in the first place is a synchronous web framework. So you cannot run WebSockets on Django out of the box because it just does not work by design. What they did, it was a good idea, uh, they created a, a synchronous server next to the synchronous server. So actually when you send the WebSocket data in Django, you're not sending it through the main web server, you're sending it on kind of an alternative one, which is a synchronous which supports this thing. And then they integrate. So please understand that Django channels has little to do with Django. They tried to write it in the similar way and they succeeded, but it's still two different libraries working in totally different ways. They are somehow integrated and the toolset is really cool and really huge. It's nothing comparing to Tornado because it has all of the broadcasting features, the sessions, the users. Tornado doesn't have it, you have to implement it yourself. So like in Django channels, it's relatively easy to say, um, to map the user to the WebSocket connection if you want. If you want to split your users by group, like only this group will receive this message. In Django channels, it's easy. In Tornado, you have to do it yourself, even though it's also easy, but you have to do it. Okay, now let's go to the next one, the bonus one, the WebSockets package called WebSockets. This is how it looks. This is really the, the most minimalistic thing I have found. So the, you have just one uh, function, one handler that is handling your WebSocket connections. And here you can use the asyncio library with async await syntax if you like. So I think it's quite self-explanatory. I tried to build up this example very minimalistic again. Uh, you do the await WebSocket receive, meaning that you uh, idle in that moment until the data arrives. When it arrives, it's written to the name variable. Then you formulate the string that you want to send back. And then you again do the await websocket.send, sending it asynchronously. And that's it. And that three lines on the bottom are just running the async IO loop, quite standard stuff, I would say. And you can integrate those because Tornado runs on uh, async IO, not out of the box, but it supports async IO loop. So you can run both. I don't know why would you need this, but people ask these questions. If I can integrate this, you can. All right, so this looks already like some dialogue to me. If you use WebSockets, I noticed your reaction to the guy kicking the robots from Boston Dynamics. I see that you're also concerned about this topic, so I think at the end of the presentation, it's important to show you that there is a petition. <laughs> Stop robot abuse. And the best thing are the comments there. <laughs> so feel free to sign it. I think it's outdated, but it's hilarious. I had to add it there. Now the commercial time, sales time. I run a Python agency. If you have projects or you're interested in doing a project with me, please contact me. Let's see how many tomatoes are on me by now. <laughs> Lots of cats. Lots of cats. Well, this is nice. It's like a paradise. Cat paradise. <laughs> The funny thing is that I was really in a rush for this demo, so I have no way to flush it now. I need to redeploy the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I will not, because it's really cute, isn't it? Okay, uh, yeah, then last thing, uh, the credits. There are really cool uh, articles online about WebSockets and about uh, using them with Python, also the videos. And that's it, thank you very much. Okay, any other question? Please stand up and come here. Um, you, you said that um, it's uh, over the HTTP, the WebSocket. Uh, you start with it, it, yes. It start with it, so can we have all the, it's a get, uh, I think. It's a get re request uh, at first. And can we have all the parameters there, like a, a, a get par a get parameter uh, get parameters, just to know what to send, uh, or what yep. to do with uh, with this WebSocket? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for the question. So yes, uh, you start with HTTP because you never know if the backend supports uh, the the WebSocket. So you start with uh, you are connecting as if you are connecting an HTTP. 
but you only do it not to send the data, you only do it to ask if we can upgrade to the WebSocket connection. And if you can, there are no GET requests, there are no parameters, nothing. So if, if the server and the client both support WebSockets protocol, as soon as the connection will be established, you totally forget about HTTP. So no, you cannot get parameters, and you do not have statuses, and you do not have request types like get post put, that doesn't exist. HTTP is really used just as a transport at the first phase to establish the connection, and that's it. And it is done that way in order to be compatible with firewalls, reverse proxies, and so on. So the protocols are very different. They have not so much similar, because the WebSocket was uh, developed in order to maximally decrease the overhead of sending messages back and forth. Basically, in WebSocket, everything you send, almost everything, is a message. There are a few frames at the beginning of the data frame indicating the order so that the backend can then combine this WebSocket message pieces into one big message, and that's it. That's all the metadata that is sent, so no parameters. Thanks. More questions? How practical WebSockets for Python lie? Are the libraries and the frameworks there so they could scale big projects, I guess? Yeah, so how practical are WebSockets in Python? Like, <laughs> but would you have it like on a big project? Like, would you scale it there? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Yeah. Well, first of all, most of the things that, uh, as I mentioned, the, in the use cases of collaborative editing, multiplayer games, and tracking systems are already on WebSockets, like Google Docs. So it's quite a big project, I would say. It's not in Python, unfortunately, but it's basically the only way that you can do the reliable full duplex communication these days between the client and the server. So it's not like you have much of a choice. You can use Ajax, yes. But if you have, imagine like this room right now, sending these cats with Ajax, I mean my poor server would just die <laughs> from that. And since you used in context of Python, um, uh, I can mention again that it's especially well playing in Python because you have async await syntax. So it's really cool, you don't have to do the callback spaghetti as you have in, in JavaScript. Uh, you can use async io with async await syntax and it even looks nice and you do not see much of a difference with a normal uh, request handler like you have in Flask or Tornado or Django. You just put a wait and it's perfect. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, that's a, oh, okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> yes. And, and does this work? Yes. So um, I am using WebSockets for uh, a trading application and it's, um, the bandwidth is ab it's using is about maybe one or two megabits per second, not megabytes. A and um, I find that the library I use is consuming up to like 25% CPU just to pass messages. What library do you use? Uh, uh, I think it's WebSocket-clients, and, and it's something built on top of it, but do you find that is normal, or is it way too much overhead? I have to be honest, I never used a WebSocket library because that's all you need to write a WebSocket connection, this <laughs> 10 lines or something. So I know that in the old days, when WebSockets have been just introduced, you had a lot of browser introducing Internet Explorer that did not support it. Then you had to use something like Socket.io that would fall back to long polling, and if it, that doesn't work, it would fall back to Ajax requests. Yes, but these days are gone. That's it. All of the browsers, including IE, I think since even... Yeah, it's, I have yeah. to say, it's a command line client in Britain and Python. has got nothing to do with the JavaScript world. Ah, Python clients. Um, okay, which name again? It's uh, WebSocket-Clients. I, I, don't, I mm -hmm. wonder if you could be uh, able to uh, advise, you know, efficient CPU-wise WebSocket libraries. Mm, I mean that you can just use the standard async IO with the WebSockets yeah. library. That's what I was using uh, when I was experimenting. In production, I use Tornado mm -hmm. always for WebSockets because it has other things that the web browser, uh, that the web server needs, uh, like templates. Uh, sessions and so on, uh, but if you just need pure WebSockets, then the WebSockets library is okay. I never seen any uh, CPU or memory issues with it, to be honest. Yeah. It is probably just a fluke with the library. Yeah, it could be that the library is out outdated, but at the end, if you're using WebSockets with async IO, uh, something that would cause you uh, a lot in your resources would be async IO, and it's optimized quite well now. 
So I don't think that you will encounter any problem with that. Okay, thanks. Great. You're welcome. Hi, on um, your last slide, you had a link to um, WebSockets versus REST APIs. Can you just talk a little bit about the difference? Yes, sure. Uh, REST APIs are using the, uh, uh, the HTTP. So with that, you automatically, when you're writing the REST client, you can first of all rely on the status codes, as I said, that if you do any request and it returns you any, num any number in the status that begins with four, you can understand that you are doing something wrong with your requests. It would be probably parameters. You forgot something in your parameters or you didn't authenticate. That's another status code actually, but RESTful APIs are not always implementing it. So like um, just having uh, a default responses can already give you some hints on what you're doing wrong and what you're doing right. Like if you get response to 100 status means everything is perfect. On WebSockets, you don't have it. So let's say you receive a WebSocket message, okay. That's probably good. But the fact is that you do not even need to receive any message because when you send the WebSocket message to the backend, there is no response by default. Only if the server wants to send you something back, you will know if it even worked or not. Like here you just sent cats to me and the only way you know that it's there is by seeing it on the page, meaning that the whole loop worked. In the RESTful APIs, you would see in the shell over there on the right, uh, red, red signs, like you know when, when something on the HTTP goes wrong, the debugger tells you automatically, like on this line, in this file, or in this connection, something is bad. In WebSockets, you don't have it. You have to debug everything by yourself. You have to understand everything by yourself. The browser knows nothing about your communication. And that's the first and I think the biggest difference and difficulties in building APIs uh, in using WebSockets and using a RESTful approach. And secondly, it's just hard to compare it because there's two di totally different paradigms. I'm just comparing it now from the technical side, like uh, exactly the protocol and implementation. But in general, like you can also think uh, on the web sockets, when you uh, reconnected to this page, like did the page reload, what I have to do here is send one message for each object over there. In a RESTful API, you would usually send them all at once, like one big thing. And the big difference is that you could cache it with RESTful APIs. Here you can't. So it's kind of different approaches. The web sockets are really tailored to be one by one communication. So I'm sending everything to everyone, I cannot cache it. That's another thing. Yeah, I mean, we can discuss it for a really long time because RESTful and WebSockets are two different sites uh, uh, at this point, but I think that these are two main differences as of a technical protocol perspective. Welcome. Uh, one more question. Uh, is it, uh, does a WebSocket can be based on the path of uh, the server? It is, yes. So uh, to connect to WebSocket, this is the path that I'm using right now. WS is normal WebSockets. WSS is the secure WebSocket, kind of the HTTPS for WebSockets. And yes, you can have different passes here. And this would map in your application server to different handlers or endpoints that will be handling that. Hi. Um, what's the behavior of WebSockets? When, for, when the client is roaming, or roaming it's uh, in a mobile, for example, and changing from one, uh, losing the connection for some reason, but reconnecting later. You don't have it. So again, uh, in HTTP requests, if you're doing GET requests and something is wrong with connection, since GET is always idempotent, the browser knows that it can just repeat it. You can do it again and again until it gets something. In WebSockets, you don't. And there is no uh, success message or failure message. So you sent it network gun, you don't know if it was delivered or not. It's TCP, so on the protocol level you do know, but you do not know if it was complete, if it was successful and so on. So this is, yeah, it's a big difference. You don't have this. You have to take care of it by yourself. So uh, the, the usual thing is that the, in the client the connection is lost, then the client connects again. And yes, yes, but you have to implement it. From. You have to implement it yourself. Okay, so, uh, one more. Hi. Um, so can you do query parameters for WebSocket requests? No, you can't. Okay. That's a quick one. <laughs> yeah. 
What's the point of using async if you don't uh, get a rec uh, response at all? So where, where's, where's the async actually mattering? Uh, Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Yeah, well, there are many cases of uh, using WebSockets. Like, first of all, on the on the if we if you ask me about the async, I'd first of all think on the on the backend. On the backend side, it's fully async. You do not have an overhead of keeping the connection open as you have in WebSockets. Uh, in sorry, in long polling, um, the protocol is tailored that way that you have minimal overhead of multiple connections. So with just minimal AWS machine, you can easily uh, solve the 10K connection problem. It costs uh, backend nothing. And you can use a single-threaded server like Tornado or Node.js to handle them, and you can use a fancy async await syntax on Python. So even if you are not using, uh, if you're not using it in a request response fashion, which you actually shouldn't do because it's totally up to you. You can just uh, receive messages. You do not have to send something back. If it's, let's say, a tracking application, you just want to get the positions of your items somewhere. You're just collecting them. You're not sending anything back. But the way you're collecting them are asynchronous in the sense that the connection is open. You do not do anything with that connection. The data comes through. And only when it comes through, your code is triggered just as you have on the HTTP connections as well, if you're using the async IO, similar thing, but without the HTTP overhead. OK, I think this ties up. Now, Good. Well, OK. Coffee <laughs> break. OK, you topic break, yeah. Yeah, ask me on the coffee break if yeah, you right. have more questions. Thank so you very much for attention. Okay,